I mean, often when people talk about poetry being political, they mean it in kind of a narrow sense. Um, I think, in fact, I think it's, it, it, it's quite impossible for, for poetry not to be political. There's this, there's this idea that, you know, that gets bandied around that, um, that poetry... Well, it, it's a really old argument, actually, and it doesn't just apply to poetry. It applies to all the arts, this idea that art is somehow separated from society. And it goes right back to the 19th century and the aestheticist movement. Um, and you know, and if you if you do follow that argument, which I think is completely flawed, then um, you know, we'll say that poetry is either um, like kind of proper poetry, if you like, is is not political. It's concerned with private experience. And for me, the political is implicit in every kind of act of writing, especially something which is is published. As soon as you publish, you know, that making public of the work, whether it's reading it or whether it's putting it on a blog or whatever, you're immediately, um, it's immediately something in the world. And so the, the relations of power, um, as articulated by language, are, are in it. And so it can't help but be political. And so I guess the, the, the point is that um, a poetry which claims it's not political is political, it's just, hiding the, it's just hiding its politics. You know, a lot of the poets whose work I admire have consistently worked towards a kind of ethical project in their poetry and I think that's I think that's the start of you know that's the beginnings of a political project I'm thinking of include people like Geoffrey Hill um, Peter Riley Denise Riley Douglas Oliver this kind of tradition of trying to trying to think and write an ethics um, a, a, a poetic ethics it's a way for me of trying to um, investigate uh, the a, a public life which is kind of infiltrated by the mechanisms of, of capital basically so all these things I mean you know um, fireworks is a kind of baroque expression of of power but also of pleasure um, um, uh, bicycle couriers as people who um, inhabit a kind of uh, you know they, they do the kind of they do the the necessary communicative they fulfil the necessary communicative function of like of businesses and um, by but but also sort of whilst also trying to um, rebel against that in a way. So this is um, fireworks, which is one of the poems from the um, series called "Some Theatrical Branches of the Muses' Vine," which are legitimate topics of poetry. Their saltpeter trajectories are split at the root. One traces the destruction of all good surfaces, the horrific ruin of epithelia. It pollutes the other, yes, and spices it, the depth and artifice the flat sky gets lent. They are liked by small children, though not by pets. And, indeed, children don't neglect to write poems about them. This tendency creeps in with adulthood and is a mistake. Up, up, up. Triss, triss. Bang. They sketch a ghostly commons from incandescent specks. It is our chemical weather, susceptible to drift, ornate mixture of earth and breath. Even for a private celebration, they are sent up over the wall. Solitary and emulsified by rain, or packed in so the cordite pricks each nostril. No one trusts them, the claim to pure expenditure and nothing back the way they compel a crowd to crane upwards. Everyone is a poet of place in the sense that they come out of a particular um, social, economic, geographical um, environment um, which influences what their interests and, you know, that kind of idea. You know, I'm a, I'm a materialist. Ultimately, I don't think there's anything apart from these kind of very concrete influences on, on literature, um, but that's not to say you're necessarily defined by them. Um, those, that, those, that series in particular is, trying, is an attempt to sort of work through a place that I find very interesting and that I can continue to, to study. Um, I'm actually writing my PhD on the Isle of Purbeck. How so, did those poems actually come about? Well, I was, um, I was taking part in some workshops, so I was going down, I mean, you know, I live in London now, um, but I was going down to Dorset every month and I was um, um, taking part in a series of workshops which were held um, 
with a group of, of local writers um, re uh, run by a guy called Paul Highland, who um, is a poet and writer of um, novels and other things as well. And um, yeah, I was kind of researching the area, reading um, antiquarian books, reading these archaeological reports, um, reading books by really interesting um, figures who, who lived and worked there in the past, um, a guy called Eric Benfield, who was a stone quarrier and, um, and a novelist as well, I wrote a few um, really interesting, very kind of, but also sort of quite challenging books. So an attempt to try and come to terms with all these things and to, and to, um, to sort of, un basically to try and understand the present as a, um, to, I guess to, to see what an investigation of the past might yield for an understanding of the present. The archaeologist's descriptions are care embodied. There is a particular language that objects speak, an oblique, obdurate song. Notate, translate, publish. This is salvage poetry, and the jumbled mess I've made of numbered pits and kilns, occupational debris, more like looting. The legality of this occupation is in question. When is it not? I've disturbed the context.